Webseiten. Ms. Dadelin, nice to have you here. On April 4th, the champagne corks were popping, probably even more so in Brussels. At the NATO headquarters, there was chocolate cake, and later, at the Sassior, which is the NATO Supreme Allied Commander, there was a gala dinner with specialties from all NATO member countries. So, from the outside, it looked like a successful birthday party. You have now also decided to contribute something to this NATO birthday. However, it seems to be less of a eulogy and more of a settling of scores with the Alliance of Values. That sounds quite harsh at first. Does the old lady NATO really deserve such a reckoning on her 75th? Yes, first of all, it must be said that 75 years of NATO, especially as an organization, could be a reason to celebrate. However, I would say that NATO is in a really difficult, if not existential, crisis. It faces very big challenges due to its policy of expansion and escalation. By expansion, I mean the geographical extension towards Asia. It's not just about the North Atlantic anymore, so the North Atlantic Treaty, but NATO is also expanding towards the Indo-Pacific. So, we are dealing with an overstretching of NATO. At the same time, it increasingly relies on escalation and brings us to the brink of a third world war. This happens, for example, through the proxy war against Russia in Ukraine, where there is a reliance on the use of ever heavier weapons. It's not just about helmets or bulletproof vests or tanks anymore, but also about demands for the deployment of their own troops. The French president recently said that NATO is brain dead. I would say it's not just brain dead, but has completely missed its purpose, has outlived itself as a relic of the Cold War and endangers the security of the world and all populations. That's why, of course, I sat down to take a closer look at NATO on its 75th anniversary. Given the challenges and crises it faces, NATO increasingly relies on myths to legitimize itself. These myths include the self-perception as a defense alliance, as an alliance of values, as an alliance of democracies that rely on the rule of law and human rights. But let's stick to democracy. At least from the outside looking in, I would say that, as far as I can see, indeed all member states are at least formally representative democracies and also have a somewhat functioning rule of law. So where does your criticism begin? You say that's all not true. That is, as you said, a pure myth. This aspect of democracy, human rights, freedom, which is also manifested in the founding charter, where do you see the discrepancy? Yes, NATO was founded in 1949, with the USA and Canada as well as other European countries at the forefront. One of these countries was Portugal, under the fascist dictator Salazar. He ruled until the Carnation Revolution in 1974, and it was not a problem that he was a fascist dictator who left a trail of blood through Africa with his colonialist policy and relied on repression and terror against opponents and leftists domestically. In my opinion, this represents a blatant contradiction to NATO's self-image, which claims to have always been an alliance of democracies and constitutional states. At the same time, it was also not a problem to conclude military agreements through NATO's leading power, the USA, with the fascist Spanish dictator Franco or take Turkey, which is still a member of NATO today and experienced several military coups in the 1980s, during which hundreds of thousands were imprisoned for their political activities because they were, for example, leftists or trade unionists. This was also not a problem, although it was a military dictatorship. The same applies to the military coup in Greece. Here, too, one can hardly speak of democracy or the rule of law. And that was never a problem for NATO, and it still isn't to this day. 
For example, it is known that Turkey, under President Erdogan, has supplied Islamist organizations such as ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or Al-Arar al-Sham with weapons in the war against Assad's regime in Syria. NATO has no problem with Islamist terrorist organizations being supported by its member states, by serving in these countries as staging and retreat areas, being cared for in hospitals when they are injured, or being equipped with weapons, possibly even with weapons from other NATO countries like the Federal Republic of Germany. It is important to dispel these myths of NATO. NATO was never an alliance of democracies and constitutional states. This is evident today as well. The leading power of NATO, the USA, acts internationally at its own discretion. It has attacked countries worldwide, violating international law, as in the invasion of Iraq under a coalition of the willing. In the last 20 years, the USA, in the so-called War on Terror, is responsible for over 4.5 million deaths, as studies from the prestigious Brown University in Rhode Island, USA, show. This can hardly be described as a policy of respecting human rights or democracy. Perhaps, to stay on the topic of the rule of law, in this attempt to deconstruct the NATO myths, you also refer to Julian Assange as a prisoner of NATO. Is it really justified to directly address NATO's role in this way? I mean, the main responsible parties are actually the USA and Great Britain. From this, to conclude that one can actually describe Assange as a prisoner of NATO, how would you see that? So first of all, regarding the self-perception of NATO, you say yes, the principle of one for all, all for one applies. This means a part stands for the whole and the whole for a part. It follows that we can all be held liable together. The persecution of Julian Assange, a journalist who made public U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, has led to him being deprived of his freedom for 12 years now. For five years, he has been in a high-security prison in Great Britain, and in the USA, he faces 175 years in prison, which is essentially equivalent to a death sentence, and all because he made war crimes public, for which there has been no atonement to this day. They remain unpunished. The responsible parties, like the U.S. war criminal George W. Bush or Tony Blair from Great Britain, live freely in their villas. Julian Assange, on the other hand, who exposed the war crimes for which they are ultimately responsible, sits in captivity. Of course, it is true that the USA represents the leading power within NATO, thus one can equate NATO with the USA. She is the power that ultimately uses NATO as a geopolitical instrument. NATO has been an instrument of the USA since its inception. The model for this was the Inter-American Treaty, the Pax Americana, to secure the West as a sphere of influence for the USA and to create the instrument NATO for this purpose. In fact, it may be that NATO member countries give up their sovereignty by becoming members of NATO. They place themselves under the leadership of the USA. Therefore, what the leading power of the USA does, such as the violation of international law in Iraq, or the political persecution of the journalist Julian Assange, is also attributable to the entire NATO. Especially since none of the NATO member states has publicly criticized the USA. The NATO Council did not even meet to criticize the invasion of Iraq. It was not a topic at all. On the contrary, it was quasi also supported. Although officially not a member of the Coalition of the Willing in the Iraq War, for example, overflight rights were granted and the use of military bases, also on German soil, was allowed. In my opinion, it is legitimate and justified to attribute the actions of the USA to the other NATO member states as well. I would like to address another point, namely the myths of NATO. A major myth is that NATO is a defense alliance. On the 75th anniversary of NATO, we also remember the 25th anniversary of NATO's war of aggression against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, 
This war was a clear violation of the UN Charter's prohibition of force, as there was no resolution from the UN Security Council. The former German Chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, has publicly admitted that he had no mandate for the attack, during which, among other things, television stations in Serbia, in Belgrade, were bombed, and the Chinese embassy was allegedly hit by mistake. Since this attack on Yugoslavia and later missions, such as in Afghanistan or the regime change war in 2011 in Libya, it is evident that NATO is an alliance for warfare. Und dann später auch mit Afghanistan oder auch dem Regime Change Krieg 2011 in Libyen. Perhaps we should briefly revisit the role of the USA within NATO. You also describe this constellation as an empire with its vassals. There is a well-known quote by Lionel Ismay, the first NATO Secretary General. He said that NATO was founded to keep the Germans down, the Russians out, and the Americans in. Would you say that this assessment of NATO's founding still holds true today, or have there been changes in NATO's function in this regard? in sozusagen der Funktion der NATO, was das angeht. Nun, die, uh, also das Ziel meiner Meinung nach... Well, the goal or the purpose that Ismay formulated back then has been fulfilled. If one looks at the development of the last few decades after the end of the Cold War, one is reminded of the Charter of Paris, in which a new European security order, a common European house, was advocated. The idea was also to realize this together with the successor state of the Soviet Union, that is, Russia. However, the situation looks very different today. NATO, despite the promises it made, has continued to extend its presence towards Russia, most recently with the inclusion of Finland and Sweden. The fact is that, for example, the Federal Republic of Germany is harming itself through the economic war against Russia due to the war in Ukraine. Germany has been subdued as a competitor, so to speak. The USA has kept Russia out and at the same time dangerously renewed itself by focusing more on rearmament and on this expansion as well as on escalation. In this respect, all of this has proven true up to today. Yes, to come back to the expansion, I found that quite fascinating in the book as well, because I hadn't really reflected on it myself until now. There, you draw a parallel between NATO's eastward expansion and the relative complete ignorance of Russian security interests and the pivot to Asia. The same thing is happening under similar conditions with China. Here, it's not about memberships, but about partnership agreements. Yet China is being increasingly cornered without regard for their security interests. At least that's the argument in your book. I'm interested in your assessment. Is this Western hubris, or actually a deliberate provocation in both directions? This complete, or pretty complete, ignoring of the security interests of relevant global actors like Russia and China. I believe it is inherent to the system. So this focus on escalation and expansion, it is not a peace alliance, not a security alliance. It is not an alliance that wants to create security, but it increasingly endangers security. With more and more armament and militarization also at the expense of the social issue in NATO member states, it endangers peace both externally and internally. I think that it is definitely a system that functions as a war alliance, and which is supposed to stop the decline of the hegemon USA. It serves exactly this purpose. And it's not just about partnership agreements or military agreements. Parallel to NATO's eastern expansion, it continues in the same way. The former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, Stavridis, even advocates for the membership of individual countries, with which one tries in the Indo-Pacific region, such as Japan, South Korea, Australia, or New Zealand, to advance this encirclement of China by NATO. He is indeed advocating for the active membership of these countries in NATO. The discussion goes far beyond just agreements with partners representing NATO in the Indo-Pacific region, or opening a door for NATO. There are also discussions about a liaison office in Japan that NATO wants to open. 
The expansion into Asia is progressing because there is increasingly a declaration of hostility towards China. China's growth, rise, and cooperation with other countries, as well as its weight in international diplomacy, are increasing. This is not seen as a potential gain or progress that could be mutually beneficial. Instead, the USA sees this as a threat to their global hegemony, and therefore opts for confrontation. The danger is great that NATO will be drawn into this confrontation as a geopolitical instrument of the USA, with Germany participating in it. Since we're on the topic of confrontations, a world region we haven't yet focused on, but which is also addressed in your book, is the current conflict in Gaza. I believe it's almost impossible to call it a war anymore. Now, you were also in The Hague for the hearing of Nicaragua's complaint against the Federal Republic of Germany. Moving a bit away from the book, but I find this to be a very interesting aspect as well. How did you perceive this hearing? Yes, I found it remarkable that I was actually the only parliamentarian there. I don't think it's every day that the Federal Republic of Germany is accused of aiding and abetting genocide before the highest court in the world, namely the International Court of Justice. It must be said this is the highest appellate court. Therefore, I was quite astonished that there was so little interest, or actually no interest at all, from deputies, including colleagues from other parties, in participating in this historic trial. The first day was the day of the accusation by Nicaragua. The charges state that the Federal Republic of Germany has not fulfilled its obligations under the Genocide Convention, namely to do everything to prevent a genocide. That means not to do or omit anything that could facilitate a genocide. The complaint states that the delivery of weapons of excessive arms shipments to Israel by the Federal Republic of Germany leads to a plausible risk of genocide and alleged violations of humanitarian international law by Israel with these weapons are facilitated. This is the accusation that the Federal Republic of Germany assists and facilitates this. And interestingly, Nicaragua's lawsuit is based on parliamentary inquiries by the alliance around Sahara Wagenknecht in the German Bundestag. In these inquiries, we have worked out the numbers and facts regarding the excessive arms deliveries by Germany to Israel, despite the truly terrible events in the last weeks and months. Of course, Israel has the right to self-defense, like any other country that is attacked. But what we have been seeing and experiencing for weeks and months has nothing to do with self-defense anymore. It is a vendetta marked by war crimes. Therefore, it is naturally also an indirect participation in war crimes if one continues to supply weapons to this country. On the day of defense, Germany presented itself in a way that I found to be presumptuous, ignorant, and arrogant. In summary, it can be said that Germany argued that it could not aid and abet a genocide that has not yet been determined. So, they presuppose the genocide to consider a lawsuit for complicity as possible at all. And this is, of course, a complete reversal of the Genocide Convention. One should do everything possible to prevent it. It's about the prevention of genocide. This arrogance was also very tangible, accusing Nicaragua of having the audacity to sue the Federal Republic of Germany. Germany provides so much humanitarian aid internationally and has learned from history, from the Holocaust, and has committed itself to international law. How can anyone sue Germany? So, they didn't even address Nicaragua's specific arguments, but instead took a moral high ground, as we recognize in the foreign policy of the Federal Republic of Germany, especially under the current foreign minister. 
In summary, one must say that ignorance and arrogance prevail against this lawsuit, and I find the federal government's argumentation to be not very credible. In terms of genocide, a determination would have to be made first in order to be able to provide assistance or violate the Genocide Convention. Thirdly, I believe that it has been enormously damaging to Germany's reputation to be sitting in the dock at all and to continue to hold on to these murderous arms deliveries to Israel despite the atrocities we see every day in Gaza. This is indeed a topic in its own right, namely the loss of reputation of German foreign policy, which is noticeable worldwide, whether you talk to diplomats from the Middle East or Latin America. To briefly return to Nicaragua, something that also caught my attention, since you just mentioned this arrogance. It is often forgotten that Nicaragua sued the USA before the same court in 1984, and the verdict was delivered in 1986, true. And there was a similarly arrogant attitude from the USA, which ultimately had to suffer a clear defeat, even though they did not comply with the judgment. The plaintiff from Nicaragua was also the one who filed the lawsuit against the USA at the International Court of Justice in 1984. It may be that the federal government shows a mix of composure, ignorance and arrogance externally, but internally fears being held accountable, as the allegations are very substantial. Similarly, with the lawsuit of South Africa against Israel for genocide, where the International Court of Justice recognized plausible risks of genocide genocide in Gaza in a preliminary decision on January 26. Subsequently, the court asked Israel to take explicit protective measures for the civilian population in Gaza. This shows that the argumentation of the federal government stands on very shaky ground, as the court already saw a plausible risk of genocide on January 26 and demanded corresponding protective measures. Therefore, I am curious about what the International Court of Justice will announce in the coming weeks. Let's return once again to the starting point and the future of NATO. The average life expectancy in the USA, the main actor of NATO, is currently under 80 years. How high do you estimate the life expectancy of NATO as an institution? I think it has survived far too long already. Since the end of the Cold War, it should have been dissolved. In my opinion, we urgently need a moratorium. The expansion of NATO must be stopped if one actually wants to establish security and not further endanger world peace. We absolutely must return to international law and pursue a policy of disengagement, as developed by the former top U.S. diplomat, George Kennan. He suggested untangling the military blocs and ending the bloc confrontation. In my opinion, this is of the utmost importance. I wish for a security order in Europe that enables a sovereign and confident policy in the interest of the people and the majority of the populations in Europe, including the Germans. We should not become a client state within an organization that only serves to fulfill the interests of the USA. I thank you. Thank you very much.